On this week's episode of the RAG podcast, I was joined by Ryan McCabe. Ryan is the CEO of Odro, the world's number one video interview platform. Ryan was on the RAG Report a couple of weeks ago, but I wanted to bring him back for two reasons. The first reason was we've announced the partnership with Odro that they are becoming the second sponsor for the RAG podcast. So I wanted to announce that with Ryan on the show. We're really excited to have them as part of the uh, the team here at the RAG and we feel like the brands just work so closely together. Also, um, I felt like the story of Odro was something that hadn't been told. Ryan is everywhere. Odro is everywhere. Most people know Odro in our sector. They've got a great brand. But the story of how the business came about, even the name, was something that I didn't know and I don't think many people had known. So I wanted to tell the story of Ryan. He, he, Ryan's got a really interesting background. He comes, he's a bit like me. He's come from a recruitment position, although he was a mecha- mechanical engineer to begin with. Um, he then launched a recruitment agency and then fell into this position as a tech business leader. And the business has grown from 2015 with just him and two others to 31 staff. They've got a global client base. They work with four of the top 10 recruitment agencies in the world. And they've got a brand that is here to stay. So Ryan is a straight talking Glaswegian who doesn't hold back. It's a great chat. I I enjoyed it so much. And I hope it's, again, something you didn't know about this brand and the stuff you can take from it. So without further ado, Ryan, welcome to the RAG podcast. Thanks very much. Nice to be here. It's good to have you on the full RAG. We had you recently on the the RAG report. We're talking all about COVID-19, but this is this is where the original podcast started, so it's good to have you on. This is, it was only the diet rag I was on. <laughs> Basically, you could call it that. You look like you've been on the diet rag with your, um, with your new skin tone and your, your shaven face and your lean, running. lean look. I know. My wife hates it, man. She hates a beard. Like, I, I, if it was me, I'd have a big, like, I can grow a good beard as well. I'm one of those lucky guys that can get a right good beard in. Yeah, but yeah. Roshin, Oh, she hates it. Like, really? Yeah, I was looking. Every... I was quite getting beard envy when I saw you the other week. I was like, "Fucking hell, that's a beard. Mine's a, <laughs> mine's all right, yeah, but do, it's do not right beard, man. Yeah, that's, just, that's nothing wrong with that. Bit patchy it's around good. here. Bit gone very grey as well. If you see it, it's really <laughs> grey. But oh well, you get I, on with it. I found that from uh, I found that from my um, quarantine haircut as well. So I needed a haircut before we went into lockdown. Yeah, but. I found out that I was just cutting grey hairs off. Really? <laughs> so either COVID has caused grey hairs or like... How old, or you, just, how old are you I've now? been cutting them off. I am... Um, I'm 30. 30? See, younger than me. I'm 33. Yeah. I, was, I was 18 when I started going. So I was... Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I was at uni. It was the year I went to uni, just before in the summer, when I turned 18, I was looking in the mirror. And I, I always had a blonde patch of hair because my hair was, in, was blonde as a kid and then it went dark and I went jet black when I was like 16 and then I had this blonde patch that never changed but then it kept it, it felt like it was growing I was like it's my blonde yeah. and then I always knew my dad dyed his hair when I was a kid my dad was a footballer he played for Everton my dad, right. and he, he, was, he used to dye his hair until he was about 40 so I always knew that I knew it was in the genes but I didn't think about it and then yeah when I got to uni people everywhere just kept saying you're going great you're going great and I'm like, fucking hell um, but I let it, I let it <laughs> when I met I met my wife in 2014 and I used to put this stuff in it when I was a recruiter and uh, she was like, I met her on Tinder and she's like, you look a bit different. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, your hair doesn't look quite the same colour as on your pictures. I was like, really? And then the next... I was like, <laughs> like, I was like not really. And then second or third day she went, fucking hell, your hair looks green in the light. And I was like, oh. she said, what are you doing? So I told her and then she, uh, she forced me to wash it out and then I've been grey ever since. So uh, you're doing much better than me, mate. Okay, uh, man. But look, Ryan, um, I've, I've, I've done you an intro. Uh, I can never do it justice. I think a lot of people know you are, but for those that don't, I don't think that many people know the full story of Odro and, and you personally. So, look, just give us an overview of who you are right now and what you do. Uh, okay, my name's Ryan McCabe. I'm the chief executive of Audro. Um We are uh, UK's leading video interview platform and video engagement platform for recruiters. So my job kind of right now is... Um, it's just to make sure that the leadership team have everything they need to do what they do really well. Yeah. So, you know, right. So, right now. look, we, we'll go. We'll get more into where Odro are now later on and what you do. Right. So let's go back. So, what? Tell us the story before Odro for you. What were you up to? Um. I'm, so I'm, mecha- I'm a mechanical engineer right. to trade. So I'm a qualified mechanical engineer. Uh, I wasn't a very good one because if I was, I would still be doing that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, I qualified that and uh, 
And to be honest, I wasn't very good at it, but that was because I just didn't enjoy it. I didn't know that at the time, though. I left school and went straight into this sort of apprenticeship thing. So, um, to become a mechanical engineer, it's like building services of engineering. So I'm not like a, I'm not like a world class mechanical engineer. I'm yeah. the guy that would design like heating and ventilation and stuff. Um, and my boss at the time, uh, who I learned a lot from, uh, my boss at the time, just one day, just said to me, "Like you're just really not enjoying this, are you?" I said, "No, no, not really." Um, and he said. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to paraphrase, but he said, the reason you've lasted this long is because you can talk your way out of any situation. Um, you would have found out a lot sooner if you couldn't, you know, if you didn't have any chat. So he told me to go into sales. He said, look, if I were you, I would go into kind of engineering sales, something else. So it was quite scary because that was all I'd ever known. But I was 21 at the time. Um, so I had left school at 15 actually I left school with some exams a little bit early I left school at 15 went straight in there so mm. I didn't know anything else I was lucky that um, I was a, <laughs> don't tell many people this I was a DJ for a long time Yeah. Um, I did alright the old DJ and so I actually Ryan McKay it sounds like a DJ name DJ Ryan McKay <laughs> what type of music did you do? Commercial stuff so the stuff that was usually in the charts and like cool remixes of that stuff I was never too good at the old underground really cool stuff it was just the kind of um, the stuff that got people in the nightclubs basically yeah. was what I played so alright so yeah, that was it so you left mechanical engineering and you got a job in sales and you were doing DJing yeah pretty much so I had a bit of a I, do, I kind of tried a couple of things for a month or two so like I did freight sales for like a month maybe six weeks I can't really remember to be quite honest um, and that didn't teach you much about it but it got me um, a recruiter phoned me about a job selling 3D printers um, so and no one knew the way this was like 2014 maybe right. I can't no no more than that 2011 um, so no one knew what they were. I phoned people saying, do you want a 3D printer? And they said, no, no, my printer prints 3D pictures. I'm okay, thanks. Um, so it was a very difficult sell. So I didn't do very well at that. And to be quite honest, at the end of that, I did it for three months, I think, maybe four months. But it got to the point where I'd worked so hard speaking to all of these, um, it was like mechanical engineering workshops. And they, they all said, I'd love to buy one. But they're 300 grand and I'm going to use it once a month. So yes, I could use it, but I'm not paying 300 grand. So I had like 200 of these. So I said, well, wouldn't it be good if I could buy one and then let them use it and sort of rent, rent, rent it to them and sell them parts. So it's called a bureau in that industry. Anyway, I was in like my last meeting, my last, uh, before I was getting the sack, I didn't know this at the time, but the last meeting before I got the sack, I was meeting these two guys and, and they said, uh, they were actually going to sign, they were going to buy one. I was like, that's great. And I was literally getting everything lined up to get my first sale just before I got the bullet. And I said, so how often are you going to use it? And they said, oh, we don't know. We're just going to buy this and then rent it out to people and, and sell it to all these people. And I totally balls out, just said, I'm going to do the exact same thing. Yeah. So do you want to work with me or do you want to compete against me? But I know the market. I've been doing this for six months or however long it was. Yeah. And uh and so we just agreed there and then to go into business. And to be quite honest, that was when I was 21. And uh, yeah, since then, I've, I've worked for myself since then. I've never had a job. So you then launched a company selling or renting out 3D printer equipment? Yeah, so I let them use mine. So I, I, they would send me a part, I would print it and sell them a part. Right. So then how long did that um, go on for? Um, about two years. Yeah. So it's called concept manufacturing so basically I did that and then I found out like people needed other things like they needed CNC machining and they needed all this stuff so I started like speaking to as many different suppliers as I could and kind of became like a one stop shop and just because I'd so much activity speaking to so many people that became my buying power yeah. so my discounts would become a margin so that, that was okay but it wasn't a well run business I didn't know how to run a business I spent the money as soon as it came in uh, you know I was just I was 21 yeah. right and it was just the way I was. So um, I learned a lot the hard way doing that that way. Um, and basically at one point, I, I made a lot of money at one point and I went to Scottish, so the Scottish version of Princess Trust, Scottish Enterprise. Yeah. And I went to Scottish Enterprise and I said, look, I thought I was swaggered in, thinking I was absolutely excellent. Saying, I'm 22, I've just made all this money. You send any 22-year-old to come and see me. It's so embarrassing. You spend, send any 22-year-old to come and see me and I'll help them. Like, I'm thinking I'm some form of 
Alan Sugar or something. Um, anyway, randomly, they sent me a guy who was in recruitment. And he said he wanted to leave to be a recruiter and work for himself, but he couldn't afford to go without salary. And he said, if you pay my salary for three months, we'll go 50-50 in the business. I also had an office as well yeah. as part of this thing. You could sit in. Um, and I just said, okay. Uh, and I didn't know what recruitment was. I knew nothing about it, but that was my first taste of, of recruitment. So then you started working with that guy? Yeah, yeah, started a recruitment agency. We got up to 12 people in there. It took us a couple of years, but we got to 12 people before what? we fell out. And what? <laughs> so, so what were you recruiting? Was it all in that? Funnily enough, mechanical engineers. Right, so you, you so, literally lived and breathed the market for six years, five, six years or whatever. Yeah, so well, that was, um, I knew what engineers wanted, I knew what good looked like, I knew what the, you know, I could talk the talk. All the stuff that, I mean, recruiters know this, everybody yeah. tries to hire the kind of poacher turned gamekeeper now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was me, and then uh, and then for a couple of years, uh, and in recruitment, and that was when I ran my first agency. So it's strange because I knew nothing about recruitment, which I thought would have been a bad thing. Actually, it turned out to be a really good thing because I didn't pick up a lot of bad habits. I didn't, I needed to know why everything needed to be done. I didn't do, I didn't make sure everyone did 25 calls a day because that's what happened in my training. I made it up and I had to, my numbers had to be backed up by fact and yeah. logic. So... It worked out really well for me. Fair play. So what, how did Oddjob come about? Because you, one minute you're running a recruitment agency, then you've got a video interview platform. How's that work? That story's like a patchwork quilt, isn't it? Right, so um, go on. Well, we ran that for two years, and we were doing we were doing really well, but the guy I was working with at the time was just quite comfortable. He's, he was coming in at 10, leaving at 3. I mean, I actually phoned him one day on a Tuesday morning because he wasn't in the office. <laughs> See, where are you? He said, I'm in Dubai. I'm on holiday for a week. <laughs> so there was like 12 of us in the office, man, like you could tell me. Mm. So it was kind of getting to that point. And I tried to kind of basically break free and take some guys with me and all that. It just got really messy. Um, so it was messy at this point. And then I was introduced. There was three different people that I knew, uh, Thomas, Lynn and Alan, who I knew from different circles. And just by sheer chance, one week they all said, you need to speak to this guy called Bill. Bill's built a, they called it a video CRM type thing. Um, and you should go and speak to him because he needs someone like you. And by the sounds of it, to be quite honest, you need someone like him. So we met up at a networking event at a bank and uh, I just got, got chatting and I uh, agreed that the next day I would meet him back at the bank so he could show me this system that he built. Um, and he showed me it and I remember, and I still remember now when he showed me the whole thing, I thought that a lot of the stuff round about it I was going to say it was useless. It wasn't useless, but I couldn't see a use for it. Um, but there was this bit in the video when he said, and you just click here and you're online. And at this point, 2015, this was, like there was Skype, you had to download something, pin codes, pass codes, Zoom wasn't even a thing yet. Yeah, like yeah. all this sort of stuff. And I'm like, you just click that and that's in. He's like, yeah, that's it. That's what you need to do. And then you press this button to record. And I'm like, whoa, you can record on this as well. The first thing I thought was, I will just record my interviews, send them to my, this is genuine, like, this isn't a sales line just because this is what we say now. Like, genuinely, this was my thought. I was like, that's it. That's what makes me stand out. That'll help me win jobs. Because I'll tell them, I'll record all the interviews for them so they can trust me. Yeah. Um, anyway, what, what, was the, started, what was the platform for, though? Because it wasn't, a, that guy was not a recruiter, was he? No, no, it was for legal. It was the legal sector. So, mm-hmm. Audro... Uh, there's, there's a big revelation. Audro stands for Online Dispute Resolution Organization. Yeah, no, it sounds <laughs> unbelievable. It's nothing like it at all. No. But that's that's what it stands for. So it was it was there to resolve disputes online, like a contractual dispute where you don't want to be in the same room as the other person, or or a divorce. It would be over video, and that's played into our, that's played into our hands a lot because it was built to be secure for the legal sector. It's HIPAA compliant. It was secure for, it was built for the medical sector. I mean, we had a six figure contract for the NHS in the early days. Like, so we had, we built all these security features and it just so happened that we then moved into recruitment. So when, super secure so when you, oh, sorry, that, I'm just trying to piece it all together. So you, you go to that meeting, you've got this online dispute platform. You're thinking, does he know you're thinking about taking it to recruitment at that point, or does he does he get it, or do you just? No, so Bill. I mean, t- to be fair, I didn't really know that 
I was going to get involved at that point. Mm. But Bill always reminds me of this point where when I was talking to him, Bill thought I was just going to buy it off and buy a license. That was kind of where the, their heads were at. And instead of saying, I'll buy this, I said to him, I could sell this. And it was the first time where he went, well, well that's not why we're here. <laughs> like, you know, that's, that's not a thing, what you do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think we maybe jumped back and forth for about two weeks. And then we finally agreed to basically, the, sorry, I should mention, build and build the platform. It's my other business partner, Mark, who was right. a techie. So the story up until that point with Bill is that he wanted to build this thing. He'd been through some horrible legal battles with his old place. He wanted to build this legal system online to help you resolve disputes. So he Googled software developer in the UK, found this guy on Google to build this system. And that guy is Mark, who's wow. a business partner today. Um, found him on Google and subcontracted him to build the system. Um, so when I met Mark, when I met Bill, the agreement was we'll go down and see Mark because I think we could all work together. So Mark lived in Norwich at the time, but worked in Cambridge. Right. So Bill, Bill and I flew to Cambridge and met Mark and Acosta and just sort of got to know each other a little bit, to be honest, and spoke about how I think we could commercialise the business. It was no revenue in the business at this point. I think it was three grand in the bank and we had a hundred quid MRR. <laughs> so it was like, you know, it wasn't a business at that point. Um, and then we all just took a punt. We put, I put credit cards in, um, Mark put cash in, Bill put cash in, and we just said, let's, let's go and give it a go over the three of us. Was it already called so Audro then at that point? Yeah, Audro Limited, yeah. yeah. So it had been going since 2012 and I got involved in 2015. And that's, that's kind of where we said, right, what are we doing? And, and if I'm being really honest, like I didn't, I didn't go in and say that is a video interview business. That's what we're going to do. It was to be, but we actually thought for the first six months we were going to be a Skype killer. Mm. That's what we're going to do. Like we can kill Skype. This is amazing. And then you realise when you get, you know, you start to look into things, you're like, yeah, that's <laughs> you yeah. can't do that without a good couple of mil behind you, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. so how did it all evolve that you then started to tailor it to recruitment, and how did how did you get it out to market? Um. I picked up the phone. So to be honest, at the start, we sold it to anyone who would buy it, right? So that's just what you do. Or it's, it's kind of panic stations, if you like. It's a case of, okay, I've just put every penny I have. I'm up to my balls in debt. We need to get some money in. In the first six months, we sold it to accountants, sold it to the NHS, sold it to doctors, lawyers, and recruiters. And we were very much a video conferencing platform, um, which is good for us because we learned to be a tech, a tech platform first, a software business first, and then we learned how do you commercialise that. People think that's right or wrong, but um, and then I realised in the recruitment market that it was just so much, it's so much better, uh, well adopted. Mm. So we gave it to recruiters, and, and recruiters would use it all the time. So that what what year did you start selling it to recruiters then? Well, we exclusively went to recruiters in two thousand sixteen, yeah. but in two thousand fifteen we did have agencies on. So the that was when I was like literally right in the mix of recruitment and I don't remember even thinking about using a video ever like I, I was in I was in a market where we used to meet for coffees and lunches and beers because it was in the, the Lloyds of London is in the city where the Gherkin is and the office we had was 10 minutes walk so uh, there was no need right it was phone calls or go and meet, yeah. go and meet people um, but I couldn't have even like it never came into my head once I never heard about it never thought about it and even when we started Hoxo in 20 early 2017 it wasn't something again i thought about it was on the radar even then so it kind of and then it just seemed to explode over the last couple of years but so early days yeah. what was the conversation like with recruitment businesses back then what was because i imagine it's evolved a lot yeah um the conversation was very much why don't i just use skype it's free yeah for probably up until about 2018 that was the conversation um but that was as much our fault as it was theirs if you like because the system really was at that point just an easier version of skype mm. and we were charging 500 quid a month for an easier version of free skype it didn't cause me 500 quid a month worth of pain right so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna switch it so it was just we managed to get a few but not a lot yeah um but that was because the system literally you would it was still really easy to use it was so slick man like it was so so nice you would get online you would click it you'd be online it'd be great and then you would record 
when you stopped recording, it pasted the link in the chat window at the side. See if you close that room, we had no way of getting that back. Oh, really? <laughs> so actually, like, we'd have something, I've just interviewed someone for an hour and a half, and um, I've just closed the room, can you get me the recording? I'm like, no, oh, I'm really no. sorry. So Receiving that call was, must oh, be painful. so bad. Um, I'm apologising to anyone listening that I did have that channel <laughs> that was years ago. Um, so even down to things like we didn't store recordings for you. So we started basic storing recordings, then we added screen share, then we added short lists where you could add the video and the document next to yeah. it. And so there was a lot of, you know, it's come on leaps and bounds. We've spent millions on the system. So, um, so talk me through the first year then of you. What was it like? Where did you space yourself and how did you three work as a dynamic? So Mark was still in Norwich. Um, and he worked full time, so he did everything he did for Audro. He did on the train between Norwich and Cambridge. Yeah. Um, he literally built. I mean, we we were two hundred and fifty grand revenue from a system built on the train um, between his day <laughs> job. That's ridiculous. Um, and, and, uh, like we're still we still laugh about yeah. today. Uh, so we were doing two hundred fifty k ARR. Uh, yeah. But, but the stuff he just built and then it got to the point of okay this is starting to get serious now like we should talk about you coming on full time but we just couldn't afford it so Mark amazingly managed to get a, a deal where he would work from uh, he would work two days at Audro and three days at, he worked at the Cambridge University Press so he then did part time for both of us and then we started getting a bit better a bit better um, but while Mark was doing all that, kind of working on the train for the first year, Bill and I, Bill, I should mention, Bill's 66, right? And me being 30, that's not a dynamic many people would think. Like, yeah, if yeah. you look at the three of us that kind of founded the business, or not founded it actually, but just, you know, you know what I mean, from yeah. scratch in 2015, Mark's uh, an intellectual, academic, fantastic software developer, very, very, very intelligent man. Then you've got Bill, who is it marks marks thirty two or something? I think it's roughly the same age as me. Then you've got Bill, who's sixty six. He's a he's a chartered banker. He's a chief executive of Solicitors Property Centre. It's all very yeah. you know it's it's very um, highbrow. And then you've got me, the key man, sales guy, cheeky chappy, trying to close deals. You know, it just you put the three of us together, that doesn't work. Yeah. Right? But somehow it just does. Like you know, it's just it's. It's amazing. I mean, it's, it's strange to say that one of my best mates is sixty six, right? <laughs> you know what I mean, it's, how are it's you? Weird. How are you getting leads early on? What were you doing to win business? Cold calling. Yeah. Point blank, cold calling. That was it. Um, cold calling. What was, your, what, what, was your, what was your intro? Like? What were you saying to people? How are you even keeping the conversation alive? <laughs> I can't even remember. Do you? I think I started with uh, like, do you use? I take it you use Skype like an assumptive yeah. was. I take it you use Skype. Oh, nightmare, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like that. I think that would have, that was my sort of yeah, sales pitch. <laughs> I would have been like, what are you talking about, mate? Um, <laughs> Get off my phone. Yeah, love it. So how did it evolve then? Because I remember, I remember 2017, there was Dougie was the name I remember. Like you and Dougie. It was me and Hisham when I hired Hisham and it was you and Dougie. That's how it always felt. It was like a similar kind of vibe going on. Um, and so w when did he join or w how did the business start to grow? Um, so I made a few, we were, Bill and I decided to work in a coffee shop for a month, turn up at the coffee shop nine o'clock in the morning, leave at five at night just to make sure we could work together. And then we said, yes, it's working together. Let's get an office. And yeah. we got this sort of four seater office. Um, I got a couple of people in that didn't work out. That was probably more me than them, to be quite honest. Um, and then we moved to a bigger office. And at that point, we'd kind of committed to growing. And I said, I need to go and find someone who's really going to grab it, you know, just grab it and run with it. So we went out to the market. And actually, from my recruitment days, I interviewed Dougie to come and be a recruitment consultant for mm. me. And I remember sitting across him going, he's good, man. Like, he was, I think he was maybe 19 at the time. And I'm like, he's, you know, he's hungry. He's got something. He carries himself well. Couldn't believe his age. And then... Um, I offered him a job and he said, absolutely not. Like, I'm, like, I'm working for a 60-man agency. Right. I ain't coming to you in your back office. Um, so anyway, he messaged me on LinkedIn and uh, and said, I want to talk to you about these sales jobs you're advertising. And I replied back to him and said, no, I'm not using recruiters. And he was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> no I'd like you to consider me. Uh, 
So I met him and I knew very quickly. Yeah. That, I mean, Dougie's, Dougie's awesome. He's, he's grown into be a, a senior, you know, a key member of the senior leadership team. Um, but uh, so he, he was, was just you and him then on the sales side of the in the yeah, early days. Yeah, so it was me and him. Eventually, ended up just it was just us, and uh, and it was a case of wipe the slate clean. Let's just go after recruiters. But hiring Dougie was the decision to say we're going for a recruitment market. Like that's it. We are going nowhere else. We changed the website. Yeah. We actually we, we we actually let people out of contracts that were you know accountants and things that want to work with us, so we could develop solo interviews and. Um, short lists and all that sort of stuff. So when did that happen? Can you remember? Uh, I think it was 2016, but I'll... Dougie's LinkedIn, I'll tell you. Get it up. I'm going to tell you now. So when he started... So... Um, but him starting was the catalyst for it. So he started in November 2016. Right, yeah, so that was what... Four months before Hoxo started, so I remember that really well that period. So you uh, you hired Dougie, and then you start to focus on the recruitment market. And how did that start to take off? What was the day to day? The first four months. If you're yeah. listening, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe three months. I you done about three months. Um, it was hard. It didn't click at all. Didn't click at all. Um, we I remember us celebrating if we got like you know. A thousand quid MRR as a good sales month. Right? Mm. It was it was bad, so um, we didn't know what good looked like then, right enough. So um, yeah, so it was a slow build, if you know what I mean. But um, if I can be really honest, LinkedIn and doing videos on LinkedIn and and what you guys do genuinely, personal brand, all that sort of stuff, that's what let us punch above our weight. That's what got us in front of the right people, so that when we did make the cold calls, people would say, "Oh, you're the guy for LinkedIn. You're that." Scottish guy makes LinkedIn videos, um, and that was the that was one of the tools for Dougie to come in and said, "Look, you come I'm in. I'm gonna I'm not gonna do all the videos and make it the Ryan McCabe show. I want every individual in here to have their own personal brand mm. because I don't know how to build a brand. I'm not a marketer. I don't have a marketing department. But my thinking was, if someone doesn't like me, they won't buy from me. But at least there's a chance they could like you. Yeah, and that gives us a second bite of the cherry. And that was generally the whole thinking behind it. So, but it was about that time, wasn't it, when LinkedIn changed and people started doing it. I think it was uh, it was late 2017 or when, when LinkedIn, uh, they started letting you post video that wasn't YouTube links. And I remember doing one walking through Clapham and it got like, I don't know, 50,000 views. And I mean, to do that now, you can do it, but it's a lot. It was You literally had to say anything at the time and you got a lot of views. So I think you and I both invested at a time where others were just watching. And and it was definitely I, I'm I'm grateful myself that you know we did that and I did that at that time, um, and then it felt like watching you guys, it, it's always felt like there's been this level of momentum, like it's always felt like you know you're just non-stop. This video, it's it's fucking deals, it's new products, it's, it feels like there's a there's a pace to what you're doing. Yeah. What's it really like behind the scenes though? It's, let's go back to say that when that first year with Dougie, even I remember your videos, I remember the engage the content. What was it really like in the office when it was just two of you trying to sell a video platform to a to a whole market? Um, I, I don't know if I'm being really honest, I don't really remember much about it just being the two of us because remember we obviously we had developers, we had Vic and mm. Mark and Bill and well, that was at one point it was the five of us in the office. Um, it, was, it takes a special type of person to, to, be, to have that attitude and that buzz, even on calls. Like to get on the phone and get deals in. Like Dougie's first day, for example, right? We hadn't hired many people in life. Yeah. <laughs> and Dougie's first day, we didn't we didn't forgot to order the phone. So we forgot to order the desk phone. So he turned up and he was like, What what do I do? <laughs> so I'm like, you know, change your LinkedIn, get comfortable, just, just buying myself an extra day until the phone turns up. He was there like an hour like this, just like constantly like, tapping, tapping, like wondering what to do. And he just stood up, walked over, and he's like can I just use mobile? Yeah. Of course you can, man. Like, fire away, that's it. Crap and literally he was walking about just letting people know he'd moved, talking to recruiters that had tried to poach him before. Like, Well, we, know, we still don't have phones at Hoxo. We never have. We just diverted to the mobile. Like, I was like, when I started, I was like, I, even in my recruitment job, though, I was very a uh, mobile guy. Like, I used to text and WhatsApp all my candidates and clients, even back in 2016. I wasn't a... My my hours on the phone system would have been shit because I was on my mobile and I was always out. So yeah. 
I was like, why do I need a desk phone? One, I haven't got an office. Two, my mobile is just as good. I found an e-receptionist number can direct to your mobile. It's still, you phone my, you phone Hoxo switchboard now, it's going to hit my, mine or my business partner's mobile. It still does it. And we need yeah. to sort that out at some point, but not right now. Um, but that was, there was no real, let's be honest, there was no real need for phones. It was just the thing that I knew what you had to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I need an office phone, so yeah. phone the IT guy and say, can you get me an office phone? Like, there was no real knowledge behind it. <laughs> if you could do diverts. And how so. did your how did your client base grow that year? Once you had more than just you selling. Not very well. Like the, it wasn't like a silver bullet. It wasn't like oh you know Dougie came in and they hired more and more and more and more. It was linear. Like it was still a slog. It was still hard. We we tried to do it through partnerships. Like I I I, I drove down to Stockport to meet Volcanic um, Darren and Volcanic mm. before. You know, before they were, I think they had twenty people or something like that, and um, and I drove down there to talk to them about partnering and selling, and it doesn't work because people don't want to sell your stuff; they want to sell their own. Yeah. And if there's an introduction, they're fine, but you're going to focus on your own stuff. Yeah. So we made a lot of mistakes that way, um, but we're just lucky that we didn't overspend our office. That office that Dougie started in was horrendous; like it was bigger, but it was it was actually a choir uniform cupboard. When I viewed it, it was just rails, wall to walls of choir uniforms, and this little old lady just sitting sewing things on the choir uniforms. And oh, I'm like, they were, they were there for 28 years, <laughs> and, uh, and, they, and they just decided that they were going to retire, so they shut the business. So I came in and I'm seeing the bill, like, this is a startup office, and this is what we'll do. And there's a big window, and Bill's like, what? The hell are well, you we, doing? we 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 did similar. We moved into an office in East London in Bow next to the. Uh, next to the, the Olympic Stadium, the West Ham ground, and we thought it was the best thing ever. But then we didn't really we didn't really check the fact that it was like nearly twenty minutes walk from a tube station and it's far <laughs> and it's east. So when you're trying to hire people, it's like they if they're not in East London, they hated it. Um it was pretty big. It had two floors and uh it I think Dougie came in when he he came and did an episode with Hisham in there and it was upstairs we built a studio but it had no heat it had no heating working. It had no flooring so we had to we had to get wooden floor put in. The toilets never worked and there was no toilet roll for like seven months so we had to like buy it, <laughs> buy it and within an hour all the other because t- there's loads of offices in there that used to take it um, <laughs> and it was just like you know it's your little home though isn't it no matter what it's your little home yeah. it's your first home we were home. talking about this talking about this the other day because I think Nick was the next kind of sales hire that we had and yeah. both Dougie and I knew Nick from previous and we were talking about it like it was it was a shithole but it was our shithole mm. do you know what I mean it was like it was like, I would love to go back there. I actually, we moved into an office now, which we thought was really, really nice at the time. And now we've got our you know, sites set on nicer places, all that sort of stuff. But at the time, I was worried we were going to lose our sort of scrappiness, mm-hmm. like the startup scrappiness, because we're moving into this relatively commercial office. Um, that I mean, that you stick a pool table and a dog in it, and it just all of a sudden doesn't become a commercial office, so it's fine. But, um, but yeah, I, I do miss the place, even, even though it was above a brewery. And there was one exhaust pipe for the brewery and that one exhaust pipe for the brewery was three feet below the only openable window in our office oh, wow. so if you opened the window it just stank to high heavens of like hops or all oh, right it was honestly is <laughs> it in, are it you in it. central glasgow or where, whereabouts is it based uh, yes yeah, it's glasgow green so it's like um a 10 minute walk into like george square in the right. center of glasgow um it was it's we're still in the building by the way so yeah. our bigger office is still in the same building we love the place yeah. it's got a brewery in in the building with a pub so um the bar's yeah. great it, it's also got a german restaurant in there it's got a little takeout place that everyone loves it's on a green where it's glasgow green is like you go a four mile run around it mm. it's um so it's a great place and a street parking so when we were moving we, we didn't want to move out of that building we just wanted to keep growing at it so, so when did you move into the bigger space? I remember it on video, but I can't remember when it was. Um, October, eight, October 18, we moved into that kind of bigger space. Um, and that was to let us get to, we said that we reckon we could fit 20 people in that office. Um, and when we went in a lockdown, we had 31 <laughs> in the same office. So how have you managed that? Smaller desks. Just <laughs> so the opposite of social distancing. You are <laughs> yeah, literally, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's, there's, yeah, there's no social distance. <laughs> um, so uh, by the way, the office is locked. We don't have anyone in it. Um, but that was genuinely. We had one point six. I'm actually on one right now. One point six meter wide desks from IKEA. 
Um, and uh, and then I had to, I worked out that if I got 1,100 wide desks, so 1.1 metre desks, I'd get an extra eight people in. So we just, we did that. Um, when did you realise, like, I mean, I know you got excited about the whole Skype thing, and then it sounds like you've had a, you know, a tough bit. Of, once you got the realisation that, you know, you're not Skype, you're not, you, you're, you're good, but you are, you, you have got an opportunity to be quite dominant in, in our market. When did you realise you were really onto something? When did you realise you were like, you know, there's some, there's some real big, big plans here? Um, it wasn't, so a lot of people say it's when they got the big deal. When you got a big deal and you go, yeah, that's it. But for me, it was more when we started to see regular volume of people saying yes. Mm. So instead of closing one deal a month, we started closing three and then it started to become four and, and four, you know, we're between 20 and 40 deals a month that we'll yeah. close. And it's, it's that momentum that you realise, wait a minute, more people are saying yes, there must be something in this, but... Um, we uh, Cash UK in fact um, Cash UK came back to us once and said like we are selling more retainers with us than we've ever sold and are likely we sold a handful of retainers and 30% of the revenue after Audro came from retainers and every retainer had Audro in it so that started getting us thinking as to why it was working yeah. it's because people were using it as a value add so they were saying you know use, use me exclusively and I'll do this extra bit for you because a lot of recruiters don't realise that a recruiter in a business it rarely knows the difference between their contingent offering, their exclusive offering, their retained offering. That no one's ever wrote it down. They just say, "Give me exclusive. Why? I'll do it cheaper." Or give me the exclusive. Why? I'll work harder. Mm. Like it's just it's a horrible way to get into it. So they write down, um, writing down what you do for each service allowed us to slot in. And, uh, and clients loved it. Yeah, so, so it's like product size in your offer, isn't it? Um, well, that's exactly what it is. Do you think nowadays is it as big a USP as it was back then? Like to be able, for a recruitment agency to say, I've got video, in, video, video technology, is it as big a USP or is it becoming more mainstream now? It, it's, so it's not, a, I mean, it's not a USP, but it is certainly a differentiator. So the thing that people now have to do is, is how they use video. Mm. So it's past the point of, you know, that adoption curve. Yeah. It's past the point of early adopters. I wouldn't say it's well, it is mainstream, but I would say it's more you ha- you should have it. It's more should have. Yeah. If you don't have it, there can be questions asked now. Yeah. Especially with coronavirus, right? Like if you don't have the ability to conduct and manage a video interview process, you can't do your job properly. Mm. So that we're kind of out of that chasm now, but we're into more of a how do you use video? How can you the way you use video help me? Um, and that's where our knowledge and stuff like that started to play a big part. I mean, we didn't have a customer success department a year ago. Now we've got six people in customer success that are, they have a proper process, thousands of calls a week go out to users. How are you using it? Can we help you with this? Help you with this? They learn so much from that. So um, that was a big... So it's not only, like you, like you say, get on, early days it was get on board with video. It, I felt like you were similar to me where it was all about education you know, why you need video. Whereas now it's like, that's become the given. Even if you look at marketing with, with COVID, I mean, I feel like in the in eight weeks, it's gone from being, you know, content and marketing. People knew that it was on the agenda, but now they're like, fuck, like we, we're really, we, we, they're really obviously not got a brand here or I've really not been investing in this. And now I, they just, I don't know if it's the kind of fear of competition, but people are just, screaming like you know i really need to improve my the branding even the, the academy i've launched has gone down so well already and it's like it's it's it's, it's crazy how many people are, are seeing this but i imagine yours is even more so that it's yes it's the done thing now but it's how like you say how we use it what, what talk to us about that was it the adeco deal you did i remember when you made a noise about it, you did like a big deal and it for you it was like this is a game changer what, yeah. How did all that? How did, how did that come about? The old, the, the enterprise sale piece. Um, so we we didn't do enterprise sales at all until last year, um, at all because and I purposely. See when someone said to me, "We've got you know we've got a ten a five thousand user deal and we can get you in," I, I would I just would not get me excited at all because mm-hmm. I knew that it would take two years to close them. It would take full time two years to close them. And see, after two years, they could still say no. Mm. And I didn't need money in two years. I needed money at the end of the month. Yeah. I had rent to pay. Um, so I genuinely, I just, I just, I mean, at some point I said no. I took myself out of two big deals um, early on just because I knew we didn't want to ruin our name. So Adeco was 18 months in the making before we closed them. Almost to the day, actually. 
actually, um, because we did a kind of we did a, a recap of the process to help procurement. Um, but yeah, it was um, that was a that was a great turning point for us because Adeco by revenue are the biggest agency in the in the UK, and for them to decide every recruiter in Adeco needed Audro in their toolkit was good validation for us because we weren't. I mean, it wasn't a shall we buy Audro. Adeco said we need video. Yeah, they checked out everyone. And they put everyone through the ringer, and then they arrived at Audro being the best solution for them. And that that was good, great validation for us, and also great validation for the market. For me personally, because I'm saying, well, if the biggest guy is doing it, if we the top ten, I don't know the exact number, so please don't quote me on these numbers. I have heard, um, and it would make sense for this to be true, that the top ten recruitment agencies in the UK employ thirty percent of the market in the UK. Mm. So. If that is the case, then the vast majority of the market is now going to start moving to needing something. And if we position ourselves as the number one, which we have done, that puts us in best stead to actually grow. So the other nine, have they? Have you got links into them now, or is that is that part of the? We've strategy? got. I believe we've got four of the top ten in the UK at the moment, and um, we'd love to have. We'd love to work with everyone. Um, we'd love to have a seat at the table with them all, but. Um, We've only got thirty-one people, mm. so we can't, you know, I can't. We can't get there all the time. Um, but I would love to. So how how has your role changed? So we're going back again. You and Dougie on the ground. Now you've got thirty-one staff. You've got technical. You've got sales. You've got customer service. You've got customer success. You got. What's your actual day to day like as a leader of a bigger business now? Um, my day to day is checking in that the leadership team need me or what they need from me. Um, and then just overall, realistically, my job is making sure that the business has enough money to hire the right people. That's my job. So if they have enough money to hire the right people and we know how to do both, we'll just keep growing. It's, um, it's quite difficult, if I'm being really honest, it's quite difficult to transition into being, I'm, I'm an operator, I'm a guy that gets in. I was the, I was the sales guy, I was the, I was the number one sales guy for so long, mm. and I had to... I had to say I wasn't taking that demo. See, when that good demo came in, the good request came in, I'm like, oh, here we go. There had to come a day where I had to give that. Did, you do, the Ade- did you do the Adeco deal? Or did you pass that one on? Uh, I did the Adeco deal, <laughs> but that was because... <laughs> you had to take that one. The, the, uh, right. the ego uh, sales guy is still there somewhere. But, but I think the thing is, I said the Adeco deal, but I, I was not involved in Robert Walters or Kelly Services yeah. at all. Yeah. Yeah. At all, so like a deco because it was eighteen months in the making. I just I had it from the start. Yeah. I had to work it through. But um, I think that there, there comes a point where you need to say, "I can't be the guy. I need to let other people be the guy or girl. I need to, you know, I need to let people because you can't scale a one man business. Just doesn't scale. If, if some, if everything has to go through you, um, at one point you're going to get full. So. Um, and Dougie, he'll listen to this anyway, but, and he won't mind me saying, but there, there came a point where Dougie came in as just a recruiter and he'll say himself a bang average recruiter. And he had to, I had to get him to not only learn how to sell tech, which I was also doing myself at the time, learn how to sell tech, but then learn how to conduct yourself at a level of chief execs and chief operating officers and all that sort of stuff. Mm. And then ask them for like, you know, more than, like as much as you could possibly get, do you know yeah. what I mean, at the time until you the price structure. Yeah. So, yeah. It took a lot of training, and I, th- I mean, I, Dougie and Nick, and you know, the other, the, all the sales guys now, to be quite honest. But it now comes a point where I've not done a demo, and I've done one demo, so that's not true. I've probably done one demo this year, um, and I'm there. I get involved, and I'll help wherever I can. I'm not above demos. I actually miss doing demos a lot, but there has to come a point where the best people do demos in the system, and the business can't be me. Yeah. What, have to move on. What's the future then? So. Obviously, we already talked about COVID nineteen on the show a couple of weeks ago with you. So, um, but what 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 do you see as the future of Audro? Um, I believe that um, we've got a lot more work to do in terms of educating the market on what the best ways to use video are because we've learned a lot and we use that knowledge and repurpose it mm-hmm. for new clients. Um, so I think we've still got a lot to do. <clears throat> I know we're the, um, I know we're number one in the UK just now, but the number one in the US and Australia is exactly what we want. Um, I think that we will internationalise really quickly. We'll mobilise an international team. We've got a couple of ideas on that. Um, I think our enterprise 
strategies is starting to bear fruit and we're starting to see bigger businesses. So we're starting to hire pods for big businesses that we work with. Um, so I think we're I think we're in good shape right now to, to keep doing what we're doing really well. Um, customer success plays a big part in that, making sure we keep looking after the customers. So this is what it looks like, but we just take it, you know, we take it probably a quarter at a time. Have you got a yeah, long-term just... vision for yourself? Is it a big grand exit? Is it to stay on as chairman? or Have you got anything in your head or what you want to do? Um, no, to be honest. I think I used to. People used to, so when I was younger, I was the Dell boy at school. Right? I was like, uh, the best story I can tell is that at one point the, the bus company, the school buses, they changed their kind of boundaries and there was like a hundred kids that no longer got a free school bus. Mm-hmm. So I, f- I got my mum to buy me a laminator for 14 quid and uh, I f- basically printed out fake bus passes for these kids um, and they were absolutely spot on that you couldn't tell the difference. Um, and I sold all these bus passes to the kids that no longer could get free school buses. So um, I used to do things like that all the time. And when people were, when I was 18, 19, people were buying flats and then renovating them and selling them on. I know people still do that now, yeah, but it was yeah. like so, there was so much money in it back then. Um, and I used to say, I want to do that, but with businesses, I'd love to buy a business, turn it around, you know, make it profitable and then sell it again. And I think that is still in the cards, but I think a lot of people are more capable than they think. So I'd love to, I'd love to spend more of my own time developing people. I'd love to spend more of my own time. Like a mentor slash investor or whatever. Yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. I've said Just the same. Think. I think future for me would be the same. And, you know, you've got to, you've got to do something of value that has the, the credibility to get into that position, right? That's but, it. That's it. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of fakes in that game. Yeah. There's a lot of people that say they're doing something, uh, you know, people that have, I mean, I've had mentors chat at my door that have never, never started a business, never built a business, never exited a business. Yeah. But they think they can tell me a lot more than I already know. Yeah. And uh, it's just, it's just not for me. No. It's just not for me. But I think, uh, look, I think what you guys do and what you've done personally is incredible, and uh, it's an interesting one because you know the similarities between us, my journey and your journey. I think there's differences, but there's definitely similarities, and that's something. I mean. It, Partly why I, why I want to announce that today. I mean, obviously today is the announcement that you guys are going to be sponsoring the show for for the foreseeable, and and I'm I'm so excited about that because I think if I could if you could look at the Hoxo and the Odro brands, they're so similar. The the type of people we're working with, so similar. The attitude to getting out there and you know done is better than perfect. I'm sure you guys have made mistakes and learned from it. We've made mistakes and learned from it, um, and so you know I'm 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 truly excited to have you guys as part of this show. Um, because no, I so, think, so are we. So are we. I think the, the big thing for us is that what, what you're doing really well is you're getting in front of the right people um, with the right message. Like you're, you do something very similar to us, and that you go to the market, you learn from what they do, and then you put that back out to the masses to let them understand how to do things a bit easier. And that's a very similar ethos to what we do, which is why we're genuinely and why we're so excited to get involved. So, well, look, it's uh, it's super exciting, and I think uh, I want I want listeners to to reach out to you guys. I'm sure a lot majority, I think there'll be a lot that do know and there'll be a lot that don't. There'll be a lot of the, the startup community because I've, I've always, the vision for this show has always been for me to help nurture not only the guys that are already a business owner but the, the next gen because if I look back at the the time you were getting involved in launching Odro was the year that I was thinking about launching Hoxo and there was fuck all out there, mate. There was nothing out there to, to learn from that was relevant to what I wanted to do. There was like there was loads of YouTube videos and shit, but when it came to actually launching a recruitment company, other than speaking to your boss, which is that you can't do it. <laughs> yeah, there, there was nothing. And, and this show was the, the vision for me was that, you know, there could be so many people in agencies now going, can I do it? Can I be my own boss? Well, hopefully if you listen to hundreds of episodes of people that have done it, then it'll give you the confidence to say, well, yeah, they're, they're, they're no different to me. Um, yeah. And, and so they're the type of people that I imagine, you know, instead of going well i'm going to give it a year and see if i need video they should be thinking well when i set up one of the first things i get is video tech i I need to think right brand i need a personal brand i need a video technology part i need the right crm i need the right website there's like a you know there's a there's a tech stack now that that fucking you just if you don't have it you're just on the back foot from the start um and then within that you go and do the the stuff that you do um so look i think 
if anyone wants to reach out to you or the t- is, is it if they I guess in speaking to you directly about demos now is not the right person. So who who should they reach out to if they wanted to talk specifically about the software? It's, listen, you can reach out to me, Ryan at Audro.co.uk, or reach out to Dougie. He's client service director, so the sales and success team is both reporting to Dougie. Yeah. Um, so if you don't get me, you can get Dougie either or you're going to get really well looked after. Yeah, wicked. Um, look, uh, Ryan, it's been a pleasure, mate. I didn't know half the stuff you've told me about today, and I, uh, <laughs> I, I think a lot of people will enjoy the story. I'm sure there's part, there's future parts to it, so let's... Uh, Let's get through this pandemic and let's see how the next year or two goes and we'll, we'll get you back on and find out how our drove developed even further. Sounds good, man. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate no worries. That. Look, guys, I hope you enjoyed another episode of the RAG podcast um, and uh, I hope that, like, every week, you, uh, you know, I don't ask for any money for this show, but I ask you to share it. So if you've got other people that would benefit from hearing Ryan's story, how he's gone from being a mechanical engineer to a salesperson to a recruiter to a technology owner of a business i mean it's incredible how with the right attitude you can you can keep reinventing yourself share it with people that will benefit from these stories um if you want if you're listening on itunes as well get on there give us your ratings give us your comments because it helps us travel up the, the rankings um and uh in the meantime, I mean, look, I'll be back again next week with another rag, rag podcast. I'll be back tomorrow with a rag report. But in the meantime, you stay safe, stay positive. We will get through the whole crap that we're dealing with right now. And I'll see you soon.